Hello and welcome to this tutorial on how to build with Superfluid. Today we're going to be walking through an example of using Superfluid streams as a way to support under collateralized lending in DeFi. So what we're going to create is a system that allows people getting paid in a Superfluid stream to borrow money against the cash flow without providing any upfront collateral at all. We had this example inside of our repository. We have a new examples repository called Super Examples inside of the Superfluid GitHub organization. And what we're gonna to do today is just walk through this basic contract architecture that you can fork and make your own. So the way this system is going to work is it's going to be built on a simple factory system where you can deploy a loan by calling a loan factory contract and then have a system where you can create a money stream into the contract where at first all of the money goes to the employee or person borrowing against their stream, right? In this case, we're gonna be using specifically the example of borrowing against a salary stream. There are quite a few people in the Superfluid ecosystem, including people on the Superfluid team that are receiving their salaries and streams. And this is one potential market you could tap into by building a system like this. So we're gonna use this entire employment example as the scaffolding for this whole under collateralized lending concept. And what we'll do is we'll have an employer send money into a smart contract. We'll call an employment loan. At first, 100% of the stream will go to the employee, and then we'll build some cool things where an outside lender can call a function on the contract to lend money to the employee, and then that lender will receive a portion of the individual's salary stream as a way to pay off the loan, okay? So they can, they can borrow money against not, not an amount of collateral sitting in a contract, but against a future cash flow, right? So we're supporting a kind of under collateralized lending. All right, so let, let's start off by walking through this contract and show you, showing you how you can get the factory set up and then deploy the contract and start doing some of the basic things. Okay, so in this, in this tutorial, we're gonna use the Superfluid console pretty heavily. And like I said, we're also going to use the example here inside of the Super Examples repository in the Superfluid GitHub organization. <clears throat> so I've, I've forked this example. I have this up here for myself. And we can see here that we have a couple of contracts. So the first contract we have is the loan factory and the other is the employment loan contract itself. So I'll briefly go over the loan factory, but this should be somewhat self-explanatory. It's just something we're only gonna interact with once to deploy each individual contract. But just for the background, we have some simple state variables here that are going to allow us to easily look up a loan by the owner of that loan or the deployer of that loan. So we have a little loan ID tracker here so we can iterate this up each time a, loon, a, loon, a new loan is deployed. We have some mappings to map the address of the owner to the ID of the loan. And we have a mapping to map the ID of the loan to the loan itself. So what you can do is call create new loan, new loan on this contract, pass in a borrower amount, an interest rate, the amount of months you'd like to pay it back in, the employer. In this case, we're gonna whitelist the employer to make sure that the employer is who we say it's going to be. Right. In, our, in our case, the employer has to be somewhat trustworthy or creditworthy because in theory, because there's no collateral, the employer could just try to collude with the employee to cut the stream off and screw the lender over. Right. So we're going to require the employer to be somewhat whitelisted here for the sake of practicality. We have the borrower. We have the borrowed token, which is just going to be a super token that we'd like to, to generate this loan around. This is going to be the, the, the token that's used to pay back the loan. And it will also be the token that will be borrowed for the loan. And then we also need the Superfluid host contract to set up some helper libraries within the Superfluid protocol, okay? So what this does is it passes all these to the constructor of the employment loan we want to deploy and it deploys them, all right? Then it just tracks, you know, that, hey, this has been, this has been created. We, we add this to our mappings, we return it. We have a couple of helpful getter functions here which we'll use in a bit. So the factory is pretty simple. That gets us the exact functionality we need right here. So the borrower in our case is gonna call create loan on the loan factory and we're gonna get an employment loan back out, okay? So the first thing that our, our loan has to be able to do is allow money to be sent from the employer and have it first, all of that money go out to the employee after the loan is first created. So we're gonna require our employer to change who they're sending the stream to and instead of sending it directly to the EOA of our employee here, we're going to have our employer send money to the address of our employment loan contract, okay? So 
If we go back into the employment loan contract specifically, what we see is we have a constructor setup. I'll walk through the constructor setup because it is important. I'll do it briefly because we have other examples which explains how to initialize superfluid related projects. And then I'll get into the specific case of an employer creating a stream into this contract, okay? So we have some imports here at the top of the contract. Some of these are just superfluid, generic things. Uh, but we also have the CFA V1 library, which is going to allow us to create, update, and delete streams very easily with very few lines of code. We also have the, address, the constant flow agreement contract, which will need to help us get some getter functions. And we also have the super app base contract, which will allow us to turn this contract into a super app. So a super app, for those of you not familiar, are applications that are reactive to superfluid specific events. So we have a few callbacks that will run each time a stream is created into the contract, each time that stream is updated, and each time that stream is deleted. So we can enable automation to run each time any of those events take place. So in our case, if we go back into this exact uh, logic we need, when the employer starts a stream into the employment loan contract, we want the employment loan to automatically create a stream out of the contract to the employer. And at first, we want that stream to be 100% of the inflow into the contract, right? So what the employment loan is going to do is run callbacks to make sure that all the money coming into the contract is sent to the borrower, AKA the employee, at first, before any of the lending functionality takes place. So we'll set that up. Okay, so to do this, we need to initialize the CFA V1 library, which we do here. Let me zoom in just a tad so you guys can all see this more easily. Let me expand some things. Okay, so we are initializing the CFA V1 library up here. We have a nice little constant we're gonna to use to initialize the library as well. We have all of our state variables that we'll need within the, within the loan itself. Most of these are just gonna be coming from the constructor that we'll pass in when we create a loan in the, in the loan factory. And we also have a nice Boolean we'll use to determine whether or not the loan itself is actually open. All right, this is gonna be important. Okay, so we take our constructor parameters, we set them all equal here. We set the loan open to be false because it's not open yet. And then what we do is initialize the CFA V1 library by passing the address of the superfluid host contract and address of the constant flow agreement contract. What this little fancy line of code here will do is it will use the superfluid host contract address to get the address of the constant flow agreement, right? We'll need both of those to initialize that library, okay? The second thing we'll need to do is register this super app with the, the superfluid host. So the superfluid host contract is just this I superfluid contract here. This is, this is the host. You can think of it as kind of the brain of the, of the protocol. That's what I call it. Um, a lot of the calls you're gonna make to actually perform an action with regard to superfluid are gonna eventually pass through the host, right? That's what you're calling, right? So under the hood, your calling functions on the host, even though you might be using things like the CFPV1 library to execute specific operations. And what is cool about the host is that it can allow you to register these super apps so that these so that the host knows to call callbacks on these super apps whenever it's the, the one of those events takes place, right? So remember, we need our contract to automatically create a stream out of the contract to the employee as soon as the stream is created into the contract, the host is going to make that function call on a function or just a, a callback called after agreement created. So the host is gonna call this. We have a modifier here to make sure only the host can call it. But to let the host know which callback should run and not run, we have to have this config word set up and we have to register the app with a host. Okay, so this app level final bit here is just kind of a, a set parameter you need to include. This is actually just one under the hood. Uh, but we're not gonna go too deeply into that. If you'd like to read more about app levels, you can go into our docs and do that. But just, this is gonna be a constant, it's just boilerplate. And then what we're also going to do is set half of the callbacks that can run to be no ops here. So we don't want any of the before agreement callbacks to run. We want all of the after agreement callbacks to, to be run. So if I didn't have any of these no op definitions set, what would happen is all six of these superfluid callbacks would be attempted to, the, the, the host would try to call all six of them, right? In our case, we're not gonna implement the before agreement callbacks because we don't wanna do anything before the event happens, we wanna do things after the event happens. So remember, the stream is going to come into the contract. 
right? This is gonna happen. This first arrow here at the top is gonna come into the contract. We don't wanna execute logic before that happens. We wanna execute logic after that happens, right? So that we can, after that completes, make sure money is sent from the contract to the employee, okay? So what I do is I set all the before agreement options to no ops, which I do here. I put all this inside of our config word, and then I register the app, okay? So this is gonna do is it's going to allow the host to listen for events that happen with regard to this contract and make sure that those callbacks are run properly. All right, if you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out to us or refer to our docs. Okay, so that's the setup there. We're gonna come back to some of these things around getting the payment flow rate, getting, getting the total amount remaining, lend, all this stuff. And we're just gonna go straight into the after agreement created callback. Let's go all the way down. And inside of after agreement created, we have a few things we have to keep pay attention to here. We have a couple of modifiers to make sure that only the superfluid host contract can call this function. And we also have an only expected flag here to make sure that the only super token that can be used to send a stream into the contract is the token we define and the agreement class, okay? The agreement class just makes sure that only the, call, the callbacks are only going to run on events that happen with the constant flow agreement, right? There is a separate agreement called the instant distribution agreement. We won't go too deeply into that here, but all you have to remember is that the only callbacks that will run will be those that happen with regard to money streams, okay? So that's all set up there. Then you'll see the only function that's run here is the update outflow function, all right? So we're returning this context value. This is something you have to do inside of super, super app callbacks. This is something that's important for the protocol as a whole. I won't get too deeply into it, but just keep in mind that inside of any super app, you have to return a context in the callbacks, right? And we get a context value up here too that can be helpful for us in getting data about this individual call, right? You can get things like the original message sender, you can get user data if any arbitrary additional bytes values were passed to this function call. You can get all that stuff here. Again, we've gone into detail on this stuff in other places, so I won't belabor the point here, but keep in mind you have to return a new context inside of these callbacks. And in our case, we're just gonna pass in a single parameter to this function. It's gonna be the existing context that's passed in to the super app. All right, so what's going on in this update outflow function? Well, there are a few things that run, right? The one option we have to run is a delete, update, and create, right? So we can, we can do any of those things depending on what the inflow rate looks like into the contract, right? So in the case where there is no inflow rate anymore into the contract, that would mean that a stream was created into the contract and it was cut off. So we need to delete any flow going out of the contract, right? Remember, for the sake of this specific logic, we're just checking to see what funds are coming into the contract and whether or not we need to do a create, update, or delete, right? So if there's no funds coming in, we should delete things going out, okay? If there is an inflow and the current outflow rate is not equal to zero, that means that the amount coming into the contract was updated, right? That means it was changed. And if it was changed, what that means is that we need to update the flow rate going out of the contract. That's gonna be very important for us. And then finally, if the outflow rate is not the same and there is no inflow rate, that means that there's no flow that's been created out of the contract yet. And by, by default, there's no flow rate coming into the contract either, so we need to create one, okay? So this would be the state that we're in as soon as our contract is deployed, all right? So this state, all right? There's no inflow rate and there's, there's no outflow rate either, right? So that means that a flow rate has been created into the employment loan, in our case, for the first time. Okay, so we're gonna run this update outflow create function in this case. So what does that look like? Well, if we scroll up to it, we'll see that it's, it's fairly simple, right? What we do is we get the sender on that flow, right, using this context value. You can decode the context using this host.decode context. And this will get information about the original message out sender on that stream into the contract. So we need that. We need to make sure the sender is the employer, right? That's gonna be very important. We wanna make sure that the employer is the only one that can send funds into this contract. And then we check to see if the loan is open, right? If the loan is open, if, the, if there's already been a loan started, which we'll, which we'll see later, uh, we need to make sure that we create a flow to the, to the borrower, right? To this individual 
here, but that amount needs to be in the amount of the total flow rate going out, right? Or the total flow rate going into the contract minus the payment flow rate that the lender is due. Okay, we'll get into the, the payment flow rate and what the lender gets in terms of interest and everything in a second, but just keep in mind that if the loan's open, we need to handle that properly, all right? But in our case, there's gonna be no loan open at all. So what we need to do is just create a flow to the borrower in the amount that's equal to the flow rate in its entirety, okay? So this inflow rate value is calculated and passed in as a parameter to update outflow create. And what it is, is this combination of net flow rate and outflow rate. Okay, so net flow rate is gonna give us the total amount of funds going into the contract or out of the contract. And the outflow rate is gonna give us the total amount of money going out of the contract, right? In our case, it's gonna be the amount that's sent to the lender plus the amount that's sent to the borrower. What will happen here at first is we'll see that at initially, the contract has an, an inflow rate that's positive, right? Say we send 100 tokens into the contract per month, the net flow rate will be 100 tokens per month at first. What we need to do is make sure that the outflow rate matches that, right? So initially, our outflow rate is gonna be zero, right? And because the inflow rate is gonna be greater than zero, it's gonna be 100 tokens per month. What we'll get here in the update outflow create value is 100 tokens per month here. And in our case, we're just gonna create a flow out of the contract, which is equal to that same amount such that the, the contract's not sending or receiving any more or less money, right? The net flow rate of the contract itself should just be zero. All the money coming into the contract is equal to all the money going out of the contract. And at first, 100% of that value is just gonna go to the borrower, like we have listed here. Okay, so that's the create case. Fairly simple, that's the setup, right? The employer is sending money through this contract to their employee, and now this employee wants to borrow against that stream. What should happen? Well, we need a third player in the ecosystem here. We need a lender, okay? So we have a lender here. So the stream is still going into the contract and going out, but what's gonna happen is the lender's gonna call a function titled lend on the contract, and that's gonna send the entire borrow amount to the employee. So the employee is gonna get some money, and then what's gonna happen after that is a portion of the stream going into the contract is gonna be siphoned off, and it's gonna to go to the lender to pay off the loan. In the case of the employee, their salary is gonna be reduced by whatever that amount is. Okay, so they, they have money up front, right? But a portion of their salary is gonna go pay off the lender, okay? And that's really the entirety of the logic, but being able to handle this takes a, a slight amount of nuance that you wanna you want to think through, okay? so. What should happen in this case? Well, let's go to the lend function. What's gonna happen in the lend function? Well, first we need to make sure the lend function is external. We're gonna first get the flow going into the contract to see what it is. And we're gonna require that that flow rate going into the contract is at least equal to the amount that is gonna to have to be sent per second to the lender to pay off the loan in the set amount of time. Okay, so recall that in our constructor, we have a few parameters here. We're taking the borrow amounts, which is just our principal. We have the interest rate, we have the payback months. What those are all gonna be used for is calculating what the per second amount the lender needs to receive to pay off the loan, right? This is not gonna be amortized or anything fancy like that. It's just all gonna be done in constant time, but they're gonna receive a flow rate that's equal to whatever it has to be to pay back the lender and the amount of time they want to be paid back in, which will include all of the principal back and the interest, okay? So if we have a borrow amount of 1,000 DAI and our interest rate is 8% and our payback months are 24, so two years, what that means is at the end of two years, the lender should receive $1,080 provided the loan all stays solvent and things, right? So we need to figure out what flow rate we need to set for the lender to receive back $1,080 over the course of two years. What amount is that per second? Okay, so we, we do figure this out, right? This is the get payment flow rate function. This math here is going to calculate what that number should be. What it's gonna spit out is an int 96 value, which is gonna be their payment flow rate. That will be the amount of tokens in way 
that the lender should receive every second from this contract, okay? Fairly simple, but this will calculate that for us. We also have a function that will calculate the total amount remaining so that we can always check to see how much does the lender still need to be paid based on how long the loan has been open and what they're, what they're actually due in the end, okay? So that, that's what we use there. And inside, again, of our lend function, we run this check to make sure that whatever's coming into the contract is at least equal to that amount. And then we run our other logic to, to set the loan up. So we transfer money from the lender to the borrower, okay? The, the lender will have to run an approve function to allow the contract to spend its borrow tokens, right? In our case, it's probably just gonna be DIX in our example. And we need to make sure that we just send those directly to the borrower up front. Then what we do is we just get information about the, the flow rate with regard to this contract. We figure out how much is being sent to the contract itself and how much is being sent from the contract to the borrower, okay? What we need to do first is update the flow to the borrower, aka the employee. We need to make sure that whatever they're receiving right now is, equal, is, is decremented by this payment flow rate, right? So whatever that amount is to pay off the interest, we need to make sure that it's deducted from their flow rate. And then we need to create a flow to the lender to make sure that it's equal to whatever that amount is so that they start receiving that immediately. From there, what we do is we set some state variables within the contract once those succeed to have the loan be open. So loan open is gonna be set to be true. The lender is gonna be the message that sender on this function call. And the loan start time is gonna be right now. So whatever the block.timestamp value is for now, that's gonna be the loan start time. Okay, and that will be used to calculate how much total time is remaining. You can see we use it here on line 75. Okay, so that's lending. That does exactly what we wanna do in this step and this step. All right, so fairly simple, right? But what happens if the stream going into the contract changes? What do you do, right? What if the amount of money sent into the contract changes? How do you handle that situation? Well, we have two other callbacks that can run each time a stream is updated into the contract or it's deleted. All right, you can see that in, like we, like we mentioned earlier, there are other cases here where we call update outflow delete and update outflow update. Okay, so in the case of a deletion, what's gonna run? The after agreement terminated callback is going to run because it's after a stream was deleted, which was previously sent to the contract. We run a couple of other checks here because we wanna strongly we want, to, we want to make sure that we really avoid reverting inside of the after agreement terminated callback. There's, there are some specific security components here that I will link to in the show notes, but reverting in the after agreement terminated callback is a no-no. You don't want to do it. It can have bad security implications for your super app, so be very careful inside of the after agreement terminated callback. But in the end, what you'll see is we just run the update outflow function here again. And this time, what's gonna happen is the delete case is going to run because no flow, there's gonna be no flow rate into the contract anymore. So what's gonna happen in the, in the delete case? What's gonna happen? So what we can imagine here is all of a sudden, the employer stops sending money into the contract. What should happen? Well, there's no money sitting in the contract. And unfortunately for both the borrower and the lender, what this is gonna mean is both of their streams stop. So for the borrower, this is kind of like getting fired or laid off, right? They stop receiving money. And for the lender, this is kind of like your, your borrower defaulting on the loan, right? This is the risk you're taking by lending money to someone with their cash flow stream as their payback mechanism, right? You could layer collateral on top of this to make it completely decentralized, trustless, and more secure. But hey, you know, lenders can take whatever risks they feel are proper. So what happens in the lead case, right? We take the context as a, as a parameter, which is necessary. And then we need to also get the outflow rate of the lender. Right? This is going to help us. So what we'll do first is we're going to check if there is an outflow rate to the lender at all. Right? The flow could always be deleted before this game even starts. The flow could be deleted back here. Right? In this case, if the flow dele is deleted here, all we have to do is delete the stream to the, to the borrower, a.k.a. the employee. They just get fired or laid off and no lender is damaged by that event, right? So if the answer to this is no, if there is no outflow rate to the lender, what we do is we just only delete the flow to the borrower. Simple enough. 
However, if there is an outflow rate to the lender, we also need to delete the flow to the borrower. Okay, so that's, that's handled there. Simple. The case that gets the most complex where there are the most edge cases is the update outflow create, up, the update outflow updated case, right? All right, so update outflow deletes easy. What about update outflow update? You'll see this is the longest function we have. It could have been even longer if we wanted to handle even more edge cases, but we need to think through a couple of things here. What should we do when the flow into the contract is updated? Right, and you can think through a couple of different states that could occur. One is that the borrower gets a raise. If the borrower gets a raise, this is easy, right? The lender is going to receive the same amount of money they've been getting, right? Why should they shouldn't they shouldn't get any more interest if you get paid more money, right? They're you know they gave you debt, not equity, right? So they should. This is not an income share agreement. They shouldn't be getting more money. You could get creative and modify this so that it is an income share agreement and that you get more money. But in our case, they're they're just they're going to receive the same amount. However, the borrower's salary should increase. Okay, so we have to handle these these different types of cases. All right, in the case where everything is all good, we call this our initial case that the amount is enough to send the amount being sent is enough to at least cover the loan. Right? So let's say the inflow rate going into the contract is less than the payment flow rate. Let's say in any case that happens, any even, you know, as I should mention, even if this amount that's sent to the, into the contract is deducted by an amount that's still greater than the payment flow rate, all we need to do, again, is keep the lender amount constant, but decrement the employee's flow rate, okay? So if the inflow rate is, is less than, if the inflow rate minus the payment flow rate is still greater than zero, we have a couple of things to handle, okay? So number one, if there is an outflow rate to the lender, okay? So if there is a loan that already took place, Again, just like we looked at in the last one, if we're not in this state, right? If we're in a state where a loan is open and already happened, what we need to do is first update the outflow. If the borrower's outflow is greater than zero, sorry, right? The first thing we need to do is update the outflow to the borrower in the amount of the inflow rate minus the payment flow rate. Easy, right? Otherwise, if there is no inflow at all to the borrower, we need to create a flow to the borrower. And you might ask, what, under what circumstances might there be no flow rate sent to the borrower? What would happen there? Well, what we've done in this example is made sure that the lender always gets paid first. So if there's an amount that's coming into this contract, if the amount's updated such that it's less than the total amount that needs to go to the lender, what we've done there is just we make sure that the lender gets everything in that case. Right? The lender's gonna get paid first. If the lender is owed 50 die per month, and all of a sudden the amount going into the contract is 40 die per month, instead of saying, hey lender, you get nothing, and we, we try to do some math to split it up in, in a proportional way, we say no. The employer's getting nothing, the lender's getting everything. Right? This is like a case where you have interest payments to make on your debt. You have to pay your, your debt interest payments first. Right? They're still gonna want the payments regardless of how much money you're making. right? It's an expense. It's, an, it's a fixed expense. So we handle that here. So again, after we make sure that the borrower is receiving their money, we also have to do, because the outflow rate to the lender is greater than zero, we need to make sure that the lender is receiving their correct amount. We need to make sure they're receiving the full payment flow rate amount, which we do right here. What about the case where the outflow rate to the lender is not greater than zero, meaning we're back in this state where there is no money being sent to the lender at all. We're back in this state. What we need to do here is update the outflow such that they're receiving 100%, they being the employee, we need to make sure they're receiving 100% of the money going into the contract, okay? Finally, we have our last edge case, which is where the, this is what I mentioned earlier, where the inflow rate minus the payment flow rate is less than or equal to zero, but the inflow rate is greater than zero. So this is a case where the flow into the contract, again, we're back here, this is the state we're in, and let's imagine now this amount that gets updated is less than the amount that should be sent to the lender. What do we do? Well, I mentioned that these are like fixed expenses. We can't just proportionally update each of these. We need to delete the flow to the employee and make sure that everything going into the contract then is sent to the lender, even if it's not enough to cover the entire amount, right? We need to make sure that everything going in is still sent to the lender to try to protect the lender. Okay, so that's the case that runs here. 
there's still a flow rate, but the inflow rate minus the payment flow rate is less than or equal to zero. Okay? So how about what happens to the outflow rate of the lender, right? If it's greater than zero, right, if there's still a loan open, what we have to do is delete the flow to the borrower. Then what we do is make sure that every amount of money going into the contract, all the flows going into the contract, is just sent to the lender, okay? Otherwise, if there is no outflow rate to the lender, this is an edge case. In that case, what we'll do is just make sure that all the money going into the contract is sent to the borrower, just like in those other examples where we discussed. Okay, so there's a lot of edge cases happening here. Again, you can get even more advanced with this if you'd like. There is some logic you have to take into consideration depending on the use case. But if you have any questions on this, please feel free to comment or ask us directly in Discord, okay? So that's the update case. All right, so that's creation, update, and deletion of streams, right? We've gone through each of these callbacks, which will run each time the amount of money sent into the contract is created, updated, or deleted. Now what we have to think about is what happens when the loan's over, right? How do we close the loan out? Okay, well, there's a couple of options that can happen here. One, the loan is completed, and the other is the, the loan is still open. So let's imagine that the loan is completed, right? The total amount remaining is less than or equal to zero, right? We're past the stage where it, enough time has passed and enough money has been sent to the lender such that this loan can be closed because it's done. Anybody can call it, right? We just have to make sure that the amount remaining is less than or equal to zero. What we're gonna do is get the current lender flow rate, right? We're gonna check it out. And what we're gonna do is delete the flow going to the lender, right? We're gonna delete the flow. And then what we're gonna do is update the flow to the borrower so that it's the current flow rate they're getting plus whatever the lender's flow rate was to make sure they get 100% of the money coming into the contract again. We revert back to this ultimate state. And if you want to, you can have the employer change who they're sending the money to so it's back to the employee's EOA instead of the contract if you want, that, that's great. But for now, what's gonna happen is 100% is just gonna pass through the contract and go back to the employee. They're gonna be receiving 100% of their salary again. And we set the loan open value to be false because the loan is now closed. Finally, there might be a situation where the loan is still open, but we want to close it anyway. Maybe the lender feels generous and they wanna just forgive the debts, or maybe the, the borrower somehow comes up with the money or anybody, maybe the borrower's friend or acquaintance or somebody that wants to be generous decides to pay off the loan on behalf of the borrower to close the loan out for them. Okay, what, what happens then? Well, in the first case where the lender just feels generous and decides to delete, delete the, uh, the loan, what they do is, you know, what we do here is we just check to see if it is the lender. If the message I send on this call is indeed the lender, we delete flow to the lender. We update the flow to the borrower such that, again, just like in the previous case, 100% of the flow into the contract is again going to them and we close the loan by setting loan open to be false. Otherwise, what we do is we make sure that the amount passed here to this, to this value is greater than or equal to the total amount remaining. If not, we're gonna call an insufficient funds uh, error. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna check to see if get total amount remaining is greater than zero. Actually, this should be, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be greater than zero, sorry. If it's not greater than zero, what you should do is you should call close open loan because you don't need to have any amount paid off here. But what we'll do is then transfer money from the from the message that sender. So you'll have to approve the contract to spend this money, but it'll go from the sender message that sender to the lender to pay off the loan. All right, and what that'll what that'll do when that's successful is delete the flow from the contract to the lender. And again, just like we've discussed before we will update the flow rate of the borrower such that they're receiving 100% of the money going into the contract and make sure that we close the open loan. All right, so let, let's, let's practice this in action. I have, some, I have a test suite you can go look at. We're not gonna go through the test suite, but yeah, we have a whole test suite here. that might serve as a good example test suite for yourself, but I have some scripts up and what we'll do is we'll deploy one of these loan contracts. We'll create an, a flow from the employer into it. We'll call Lend from the outside and then we'll see using the Superfluid console that everything is working the way we expect. Okay, so I have a, our first script we're gonna run is to deploy the factory, so we can call the factory. So what I'm gonna do first is run this script.
Okay, and I'm gonna specify what network I wanna use. Again, all this is set up. Hmm. Looks like we have a uh, mistake here. Oh, I put a period instead of a slash. Let's just fix that. But if you go into the hard hat config, you'll see that we have the Guerli network specified. You can specify whatever network you want, right? So here I have Guerli. I have a couple of private keys I've used. I have a, a, a URL from Alchemy. Again, you're welcome to change this. This could be Mumbai. This could be uh, Rinkby if Rinkby is still alive post post merge. Uh, but in our case, we're using Guerli. All right, so we have the loan factory that was deployed. Now what we can do is deploy the loan. So I'm gonna paste this address inside of our loan factory or deploy loan script, rather. I have a whole setup here where I initialize the Superflu SDK. I get some signers. And what I do is get the contract object for the loan factory by using that address I just pasted in there. And we're gonna call create new loan from the borrower. Okay, so we're gonna pass in a thousand for the Borrow amount at an 8% interest rate, 24 month payback period. We have the employer address, we got the borrower address, we got the DIX address, and you've got the address in the Superfluid host contract. Again, you're welcome to read through all this stuff to set this up on your own. But let's deploy our loan. So I'm going to change this from deploy factory to deploy loan. And at first, this isn't going to actually spit out an address for me. We're going to have to use one of the getter functions on the loan factory to get the address of this contract. Okay, so I'm gonna paste this again into get loan by ID. And the counter for our loans will start at one, which is what I specified in the contract. I should have specified it at zero, to start at zero because, you know, us engineer types always think uh, that the number line starts at zero. And, it, you know, in theory it might. Uh, but this time I'm gonna run this get loan by ID script. Did the same thing again. Need to change the period to a slash. All right, cool. So I have the address of our loan. This is perfect. So now what I can do is I can create a flow into this loan. All right, and actually first before I do that, I'm gonna give it some funding. Just, so, just I'm just gonna throw a discrete amount into the contract so that it has enough to create a stream to our lender as soon as we create it. So I'm gonna have an initial transfer here. We're just gonna call it transfer on the DIAX contract to send a little bit of tokens into the contract. And the reason why this is a good idea is just so that the contract has enough to cover a deposit sent to the lender. And if you're curious about deposits or actually the, the technical term is buffer. Right. If you want to learn more about buffers and money streams and how you have to have four hours worth of a stream up front on mainnet to, op to, to, to open a stream, you can read more about that inside of our docs. I'll put a link in the show notes of this. All right, so this was successful. Looks like we have our some data that was returned. We have a hash and everything. All right, so some money should be in the contract. Now we can just send a stream into the contract. All right, so what this should do at first, as soon as I send the stream into the contract, is send 100% of the money going into the stream to our borrower, right? It should just pass through because it's a super app. All right, so what we do here is use the Superfluid SDK core to create a flow from our employer into the contract itself. So I have the loan address here. I have a flow rate that's about 10, 10K per month, and the token I'm gonna use is DIX, right? So this is the super token version of DAI. All right. Looks good. So now what I'm gonna do before we call lend, I wanna show you that this worked by going to the Superfluid console. Okay, so what we just did is this step. A, we deployed a loan using the loan factory. We got an employment loan. Then we sent a little bit of money into the contract. This isn't pictured here. We sent a little money into the contract so that had a small balance. Then we create a stream from the employer into the loan. And now we should see it all going to the borrower. All right, so let me make sure I get the address of our loan. I'm gonna paste it into the console. And what's cool about the console is that if there's any kind of interaction that the addresses have with the protocol, you'll see it pop up here directly. 
we can see that our initial funding of 100 DIAX tokens was put in here. We don't have the stream here yet, but it should, it should show up in just a second. All right, perfect. So we have a stream going into the contract. And what do we want to have happen? We wanted 100% of it to go to the borrower, AKA the employee. And it looks like it is. You can see the flow rates are exactly the same. And the balance isn't changing at all in the contract, right? Saying constant, because the amount going in is equal to the amount going out. All right, so this is exactly what we want to have happen. Now, if we call lend, so our lender's gonna approve the contract to spend some of its, its tokens, and then we're gonna call lend. But when that happens, we should see a second flow rate come out of the contract that is subtracted from the existing flow rate that's sent to our receiver, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make sure I got this copied. I'm gonna call approve from our lender. Paste this in as a loan address. I'm gonna call approve from our lender. So I'm just gonna approve the contract to spend some of our DIAX tokens as the lender. Let's just change the name of the script we're running. We're just gonna call it lender approval. All right, looks like that indeed was successful. Let me grab the hash just to make sure. Click where the ether scan. Just make sure that this was submitted. I don't know if it'll be complete, completed yet, but yep, looks like it was submitted properly. All right, so this is this is being indexed right now. I think I don't, we might have to wait a little bit longer to run our land function, but let, let's try it anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna paste in our loan address here again. Okay, and then all we're doing here is we're just calling land on the employment loan contract, right? That's all we have to do. We just have to call land. And the cool part about Lend is we don't have to even pass any parameters, right? It's all calculated in the contract what we need to send. And as soon as this all works, we just set the lender to be the master sender. Okay, so in our case, we're just gonna call mpx hard hat run scripts lend.js. Right, and this should work I'm on the spot, but this should work. Invalid arguments. Go back into lend. Oh, looks like I pasted in a uh, transaction hash <laughs> instead of a uh, instead of the actual address of the loan. That's dumb. Okay, so this should work now. All right, it looks like it was successful. Okay, so we have some data on the transaction. Let me again grab the hash. Paste it in here. All right, good. This looks like it was included. It will be reflected in a short while. Again, what we should see here in just a second is this flow rate is going to be essentially split. So a small amount is going to be siphoned off and sent to the lender. All right, perfect. So it was, right? A small amount is now going to the lender and it's going to pay off their loan. Okay, so. What is this amount, right? What is this amount? What should it be? Remember, it should be 1,000, which is the total borrower amount, plus the additional 8% interest that needs to be paid over the course of 24 months. So if we look at this and we multiply it by the amount of days that are gonna have to pass this to be paid off, it should be equal to $1,080, roughly. Okay, so this is the amount times 365 times two. Yep, okay, perfect. So you can see that there. This is a, almost exactly 1,080 die per month that will be paid off over the course of two years. Okay, that's exactly what we wanted. This is working exactly as intended. And what you have here is an implementation of under collateralized lending in DeFi. It's in a specific use case, but this should open up some ideas for you to get more creative, right? We have some ideas for future work, right? Inside of the README. For example, uh, the loans aren't currently 100% collateralized, but you could make them collateralized. This readme was written a little while ago uh, before we updated this, but you can also make the loan contract tradable for the lender. So you could, instead of just sending the money directly to the lender, you can send it to an NFT and have the, the lender own that NFT, such that if they ever transfer the NFT, the cash flows will go with the NFT. That's another way to think about this, right? You could turn this into a tradable asset in a secondary market. And if you want 
you know, you, you could create a kind of pool mechanism where instead of just borrowing from peer-to-peer -peer individuals, you could borrow from a pool, right? That's a little more difficult, but there are teams in our ecosystem that are thinking about it. There are teams working on it. And we encourage you to work on similar things, right? This is a new primitive for DeFi. And we hope you take this contract, fork it, make it your own, make it better, optimize it for gas, and do your thing, okay? So thank you for watching this video. I hope you got something out of this. Please reach out to us engage, and engage with us on this particular contract and this contract pattern, and we'd love to help. So thanks again for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.